Hello, everyone. I'm Dominique. And I'm Christina. And we are the Connected in Glass podcast. Every week, we will feature interviews with glass artists who speak to their creative processes and overcoming challenges. These conversations are real and raw. We hope that by sharing these stories, you're able to find some connection and know that you're not alone. We just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening to our podcast. We're super passionate about this project and work for hours every week to bring you this content. So if you'd like to help support us, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash connected in glass. Also, please consider joining our Facebook group, Connected in Glass Community, where we continue the conversations from these episodes. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everyone. This is an interview that I did with Sally Proch before we began this podcast. We thought that you would all enjoy the content that we discussed, so we gave it a little revamp and are now offering it to you as a bonus episode. Enjoy. Today, I stepped out of my comfort zone by recording an interview with my friend and mentor, Sally Prosh. Sally has been working with Glass since 1970, and she's an extraordinary lady with a wealth of knowledge and history on the subject. Hola. Okay, so I wanted to do kind of like a little podcasty interview with you, and I want to know your story, and I want to hear it all. Cool? Well, it, you can't have all, because you know what? It's too long. I'm Sally Prosh, and it's 3.31.2020, and I'm quarantined in Montague, Massachusetts. And um, I started Glass in 1970 with Lloyd Moore, and I've been doing it ever since. And where are you working now? That? You're working now at, um, Sir, at UMass Amherst and in oh, Burlington? Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm um, working, well, you know, they're shut down now, but um, supposedly I'm working at the University of Massachusetts and the University of Vermont doing their scientific apparatus and and teaching classes there. Okay, tell me your story. So, so when I was little, (laughs) I was diagnosed with dyslexia in first grade. And so the doctors told my parents that I would never get through high school with this dyslexia, but I proved them wrong because I now have three degrees. Um, And then we moved around all over the place to all these different cities, big cities. And then my dad came home and he said, we're moving to Lincoln, Nebraska. And I know in grade school, I studied where that was, but I had no idea where that was. And we moved to Lincoln and it was really boring. I was into rock and roll and drugs and bell bottoms. <laughs> and nobody was into that in like in Nebraska. So my mother signed me up for all these courses and they were all for adults, but she ignored that. And so I would show up to these classes and they wouldn't know what to do with me. Um, but I took all the classes and one of them was glass blowing with Lloyd Moore and he needed an apprentice at the time. And so I started apprenticing with him. So I did that junior high and high school. And I had a really good time. So I learned a lot from Lloyd. And then I went to college. And um, that was an eye opener because then I realized that it was different to be a woman in glass. Back then, you were so lucky, Dom. I know. Because now there's all kinds of women in glass. But at that point, there were no women in glass. I mean, I shouldn't say that. There were a few women in glass, and we were all abused, and it was really hard. Um, But I used, I would bring my torch into the hot shop, and I would work with my torch in the hot shop. At that point, there were no torches in the hot shop. Um, When I went out to pill check the first time, I drove, and I drove my torch, my little propane and oxygen tank across the, you know, country to pill check and um, set up there. It was a big dilemma. They had a big discussion about it, you know, like, oh, should we allow this? This is dangerous, blah, 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 da, 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 da. And you look at it now and there's tons of torches. <laughs> but back then it was, you know, nobody would touch the torch. They would say, Sally, make this for me. And I would make it for them and they would roll it up into their piece. But at that point, 
Nobody was using the torch. There was some map gas being used. Um, Flora Mace and Joy Kilpatrick were doing the um, um, cylinder things for Chihuly and drawing with the map gas. But there was no oxygen propane torches out there. And so I, I turned them on to oxygen propane. Um, and I think that helps a lot with glass. I mean, if, if you think about it, Don, there was not even a fluffy torch, you know? So Lino's first class that he came out to teach at Pilchuck, there was no fluffy torch. There was nothing. There was my little, you know, torch set off in the corner, but there was nothing on the floor for people to use. It just amazes. But he just, he didn't care. He just did everything. And the glass that we were melting was horrible. It was disgusting. I can't even believe he could do anything with it. So anyway, um, so I did my hot glass degree. And then my first year out of college, I realized how expensive it was to run a hot shop, as you know. And um, we rented space and we rented a gallery space. And oh my God, it cost so much money. And so then I decided, you know, flame working is a lot easier for me to make money at. And um, so I kind of went back to flame working, but I still do hot glass occasionally, mostly with George. Mm -hmm. Is that good? Yeah. So when you started, were you doing like um, when you were learning from, it was Lloyd, right? You were learning mostly scientific yeah. glass or was it like art glass or like a little combination? It was a combination. He never he never separated the two. So we would learn how to do a condenser out of soft glass. We'd set it on the table, you know, then we could move on to borosilicate and then we could take those techniques. I remember I took those techniques and he showed me how to make a wiener dog, right? Yeah. So it had, you know, think of a condenser. It kind of looks like a wiener dog, right? Yeah, it's got the body. So you just put the side seals on it a little differently, you know, and you, you know, so he would take things and, and take those scientific techniques and make them artistic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. He also did a lot of little knickknack things. He was really good at making swans. People really liked swans back then. Um, but he also did very politically um, complicated things like he would make these hollow slaves that were probably um, probably about a foot high and they were screaming and they we would enamel them we had a spray booth that we would spray enamels on and then fire it so they would be black slaves with a little white loin cloth and gold chains and um, screaming and you know we're in Nebraska yeah <laughs> so when we would put that out on the table that would sometimes create problems so he yeah. he was African-American right so that what mm -hmm. that really so you were a woman learning from you were kind of two minorities at the time studying something yes. and so you found that yes. it wasn't very accepted or a little bit of both or... yeah we weren't accepted at all and um it was very scary at some point um by the time i was 13 14 i knew who the kkk was i was terrified of people when we would walk down the street we would have people scream comments at us um but also it's very interesting lloyd was he would let things roll off his shoulder and so I would watch that, you know, like people would come up and say, hey, Brownie, can you do this? And he would say, sure, I can do that. You know, there was actually only one time I saw him mad, you know, about it. Um, but it was very, it was very interesting um, to learn about that prejudice back then. And you, you don't, you don't know what that's like you're you're too young to know what that was like yeah i can't um, imagine but i don't see that it's much better you know i think things are, aren't being said but they're felt underneath and i think our new political situation shows that um 
I guess people are saying things more now. <laughs> yeah. But it's very yeah. scary. Yeah, they're saying it and, all on um, the internet. Mm-hmm. When we would do an art and craft show, he I didn't know this until a couple years ago. This is really weird. I saw this movie called The Green Book. When we would do craft shows out in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska, he would always drop me off at one hotel. You know, you got to think, I was uh, in junior high and high school, right? And then he would go to another hotel. And I thought he did this because he didn't want people to think that there was anything going on between us. But I found out the reason he did that is because he couldn't stay at the hotel I would stay at because he was black. You know, Uh so he would take this green book that I didn't even know anything about until I saw this movie and find a hotel where he could stay. So when I saw this movie, I called up Lloyd. I said, Lloyd, is this what was happening way back then? He goes, oh, yeah. So he would make scales that moved black on one side, white on the other. Um, Sometimes everything on the table, he would say, Sally, I want everything to be black. And we would make everything out of lead glass and then reduce it so it gives gives you that shiny black color make goblets like that um so he did scientific at the university of nebraska and uh, during the week and then on the weekends we did craft shows so and i would go over to his house and yeah. work yeah so when you so you yeah. said when you first moved to Nebraska, like you were just kind of young and bell bottoms and doing drugs and stuff. And you want to tell me how like your experience with glass changed you? Because I think you're like a lot different now. Obviously, you're sober for one thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know if glass did that. No, glass did not do that at all. <laughs> I remember being little. And watching, you know how you can watch the end of the rod and how the light comes through it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And being really wasted and going, wow, man, that's really awesome. (laughs) (laughs) So I got off drugs um, after college because so many of my friends were dying. Mm. And I, they got so far into it, so selling cocaine and selling large amounts of drugs and people getting murdered and killed and um actually most of the people that really did a lot of drugs that i knew back then are dead and so it it just was too hard for me to deal with all that for drugs yeah so i really did enjoy myself yeah well, so talk about enjoying yourself. So when you first went out to Pilchuck, it was way different, right? Can you tell me what it was like besides, oh like, the hand torch? Like, I know that you're the first person to bring a hand torch onto the floor, which is so cool. But, like, just tell us about back then. <laughs> okay, so back then, it was a big party. We lived in Girl Scout tents. Um, some people built their own structures, and some of those structures you still still see there, you know, which is kind of cool. Um, but yeah, we lived in Girl Scout tents, and there's a lot more slugs. I don't know what happened, but there's not as many slugs as there used to be. We had the only bathrooms were the ones underneath the, you know, the dining hall. We didn't have any other bathrooms, okay? So we all shared those bathrooms. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was really nice. We were a 24-hour studio, so my shift was from 12 midnight to 5 a.m. And then at 6 a.m., the masters would start um, getting things ready. And so you never wanted to sleep. Yeah. You know, um, and it, was it was much just cheaper. The hot shop I remember my first, my first class there cost $600. And my mother helped me send me to to the school, and she thought six hundred dollars. My God, that's insane. That's crazy. And I brought back one vase, <laughs> <laughs> and it had flame work stuff on it, and it had a folded lip. And oh my God, I thought it was wonderful, right? And she put it in her cabinet and said, "This is my six hundred dollar vase." <laughs> but she had no idea how much how much we partied out there. And I remember Dale's house was kind of up. You kind of took this road, and 
it was this kind of shacky type house. And I remember we had so many people in it. We were all dancing and we would jump up and jump down and the whole place shook like it was going to fall apart. And we thought it was hilarious. And we just kept doing stuff like that. You know, like I'm really surprised nobody died back then. Um, we didn't know what we were doing. We had horrible glass. Um, and it was just the hot shop, little, right? Like no other, there wasn't it was just like... the hot shop. Later the flame, the flat shop went in and Klaus, um, was over there doing a lot of fusing. There was stained glass over there. Um, and much later, the flame working shop went in. Um, that, yeah. And then later, the the casting, you know, studio. Um, printmaking went in before casting and flame working. So um, the Lubinskys used to come and print down by the library. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was a whole different setup. There's lots of sex happening, <laughs> lots of parties. <laughs> I but, guess it still happened. <laughs> but did you, like you learned an enormous amount or was that still when people were like learning and progressing? So like when Lino came, that was kind of like, you all had never seen anything like that, right? Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. So I signed up for Lino's class because I thought, well, that's an interesting name. I've never heard of this guy before. I'll take his class. You know, we had no idea who he was. Yeah. And we went out there. He didn't speak any English. He had never seen a woman in the shop before. So it was very different, right? Yeah. And wait, what year is this, do you think? I think it was 79, if I remember correctly. And he was wonderful. He helped us so much. But at that time, we were making blogs. You know, we we didn't know what we were doing. And one of his first demos was a goblet in a goblet. So he, out of the furnace, he made this little goblet, and he put it in the stem of another goblet. And I was like, there's no way in hell I could even make a goblet, you know, on, yeah, yeah. on the furnace. You know, <laughs> there's, there's no way. And the torch... I could do it. So I made him a goblet, goblet, goblet on the torch because I, you know, thought that I would be nice you told for me him. That. Yeah. But, you know, like he was doing things that we couldn't even, even get close to. And um, he, and when that happened, I mean, it changed, it changed hot in America. All of a sudden, technique came in. Because before that, it was technique is cheap. We don't need technique. We love these blobs. You know? Yeah, all artsy. <laughs> <laughs> and cold. And yeah, bubbly. We called it art. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, you know, some of those blobs, and I think, were very beautiful. You know, I think of um, the Harvey Littleton's loops, you know, I think they're gorgeous, you know, like. Um, but most of us were just making these blocks of glass. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. so like you, you went <laughs> you went to Pilchuck and then you went back out in the world and what did you do after that? Like how did you get from where was it, Lincoln, Nebraska to where you are now? Like Okay, what? so I went to to school at the University of Kansas. And there was one other woman in the class, Lucha, who ended up working with Dick Marcus. Um, I worked opposite a lot of times with um, Mark Weiner. Uh, we called him Ginzo. Um, he's he's very um, disruptive. What yeah. do I want to say? Sometimes I saw benches fly across the room. Oh, that's a nice way um, of saying it. was a very it. macho, macho, macho time back then, you know. Sometimes I, I remember one time walking in and all the stuff I made the previous day was thrown out of the annealing oven. Um, they just, you know, oh, this is this is Sally's. Da -da, we'll throw it out of the oven. My professor the first day told me, he came up to me, he goes, I'm not going to waste my time with you. You're a woman, you're going to go off and you know, forget about glass, you're going to get pregnant and married, I'm not going to waste my time, you know, and he was serious, and that's, that's the way it was then, yeah, interesting, huh? Yeah. Um, 
So I had to learn basically on my own when I was in college. So going out to Pilchuck, I said, I have like this guy, Lino, coming up to me and helping me. He would take the blowpipe, he would make it beautiful, and then I would take it and I would make it ugly, and then he would take it and make it beautiful. <laughs> but I could see all the things that I was doing wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he was an inspiration to many people. And then how did you get over to the Northeast? Oh, yes. Um, I moved around a lot. Um, let's see, I moved to Massachusetts, and I had my own studio in Worcester for two years. And this was after college. Well, first in Omaha, Nebraska, I tried to do hot glass. And... Um, I found it was too expensive. So then I worked with Lloyd for a little bit more. And then I moved to Worcester because some guy, some cute guy said, oh, come out here. And so I did. And I ran my own studio. And then I thought I should get a degree in scientific glass technology because AT&T and Bell Labs kept bothering me. They kept saying, come work for us, come work for us. And I go, but I don't know how to work courts. I need to learn how to work courts. And so I went down to Salem Community College and stayed there for two semesters and I did two years of work down there, but never learned how to work courts. <laughs> and so then I took the job that they wanted me to take and I would call up my friends in Boston that ran a courts company and I'd say, okay, how do I do this? And then they would tell me and the next day I'd go in and I'd do it. And so that's how I learned courts. And so I worked there for two years, and then the University of Massachusetts job opened up, and so I took that, and then they we had three glass floors, and then I got laid off, and so then I just ran my own business for a long time. And then Syracuse University opened up, and I thought, oh, I'll just do that for a few years, and I ended up being there for 15 years, and then um, came back to Massachusetts. And now I'm here. Oh my God, that was a long story. That was a good story. So, but I want more. So, like when you're working at UMass Amherst and you're working at Syracuse, can you tell me what you're doing? So, you're doing like their scientific work, you're working with them on like different custom things that they need for different projects they're working on? Yeah. Yeah. So, researchers coming in with these wild idea of things that I don't think I can do, but they tell me, no, you can do this. And, um, and it challenges me and it makes me be really good technically. And I appreciate that, but sometimes it's really challenging. Sometimes it can be very boring. Um, but probably the biggest thing that I worked on, and maybe this is why I ended up at Syracuse University, is I worked with this guy who's kind of a hippie. The last glass blower didn't want to work with him because he was, you know, long hair, hippie guy. And he's a physicist, um, Steve Penn. And he was working on the gravitational wave. And um, he came in one day and he goes, Sally, I want you to hang this big chunk of quartz from a fiber optic, ba 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 and, and I was like, no, we can't do that. It's not going to, you know, hold it. <laughs> and he goes, no, Sally, I calculated this out, and you can do it, so let's get it done. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. And, you know, he was right. The first time we hung it, it fell. I Luckily, I had him have some Teflon um, kind of parachute-type things underneath it to to hold it if it fell and it did fall the first time and um the second time we hung it um it it stayed and um he was working on how to get the most the the best material to resonate the longest in the universe mm -hmm. and so we put this thing hanging from a fiber optic into a vacuum chamber on a table that would not it would it would not feel any vibrations from the outside world and um he pinged it and it rang for three months Holy and God. which i think is incredible that's but so when he told cool. me that i was like oh my god that's great and he goes no we got to find a better material and i'm like oh my god oh, these works. people these scientists you know, I think about the money he spent on that experiment, you know, 
And then he says he wants something better. And I'm just like, in the years he spent on that experiment. Um, so he is now trying to find coatings to put on to this most pure quartz in the world um, to make it a better uh, um, absorb, I guess, a, a better, mm, what do I want to say? It can take vibrations. It mm. can hear vibrations easier. Mm. So if a if a atom is going passing by it, it will feel it. That's crazy. You know, and and that's yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, crazy what these people it's are working the smartest on. Smartest people. You know, there's another professor I work with, and he's trying to find another element. He's really close to finding another element that will go on the periodic table. I'm just like, what the hell? You know, this is really awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like helping him make history. That's super cool. <laughs> but then, then you have also, with that, very boring jobs. Like about a month ago, this one professor, he's on sabbatical, but he was going to be gone for a year, so he wants his graduate students to have enough material to work with for the year that he's going to be gone on sabbatical. So... They're using these teeny tiny test tubes that are quartz so that they can read what they're working on through the quartz. And um, so he came in one day and he goes, Sally, I want you to make 400 of these. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I did. I made 400 of something and really incredibly boring. So, but it will help with his research and maybe he'll find something really cool. What kind of stuff do you make for fun? Do you have any time to do that lately, or are you just pretty much working? So a lot of the things I work with scientifically, people are trying to find different ways of getting rid of AIDS, okay? So they gotta, they have to do this plotting of AIDS first. And I think it's beautiful. So what I'm doing is, and I, I don't have this done yet, so I don't have glass, but I'm taking the glass and making this image of glass and putting it over that and having this as a wall hanging. Oh, Does that wow. make sense? Yeah, that's so, so the, cool. So the glass will magnify what's underneath. And these lines, I'll have like very thin glass holding this mass here that will also hold this mass here and hold this mass here. But I'm putting that over this image because I, I love the way scientists write and draw and configure things yeah that's so that's cool that's so cool and then um, you'll kind of like put it in a frame or and something I'm sure yeah put it on the wall um and so i'm thinking that probably we have this virus we have a nmr image of this virus and I'd like to work on that too. Um, a lot of times, you know, all your scientific glass floors make viruses and make compounds for people. You know, when they graduate or when they are retiring, I'll make their molecule that they've been working on all their life. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think a lot of other scientific glass floors do that. Um, for the people that are doing research. When I worked for Bell Labs for retirement people, I would make the microwave towers out of one millimeter rod. Mm -hmm. And it would be an exact replica of the microwave towers that they worked on. That's so you know, so all these scientific glass blowers around are doing stuff like this and nobody knows it. Um, but yeah, I would like to work more with um, images of science. So sometimes I walk into a lab and all the stuff that they're writing all over the walls, because they do, they write all over the walls, they write all over their hoods, they just take Sharpie and start writing. And it's just beautiful. And the colors that come up with, it, just the whole lab is beautiful. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Connected in Glass. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information on the artists we interview and for updates on the podcast.